Hello, this is Brian Purdy with the Florida Aviation Network. Today we're going to talk with Mr. Ed Durais. He is the CEO of Saberwing Aircraft Company. Uh, Ed and I first met at the Regional Air Cargo Carrier Association conference in Scottsdale, Arizona. Unfortunately, this is the first time we've had to actually uh, conduct the interview. Uh, Saberwing is developing the Rigel cargo air vehicle. And uh, we're going to talk about that and uh, the possible future uh, developments within Saberwing. Hello, Ed. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing well, Brian. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Not a problem. Um, well, I think we've both been traveling since Raqqa, but uh, I'm glad we were able to, 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 to match our schedules, at least for a little bit. So... Uh, tell us a little bit about the, the Rigel, uh, uh, concept of operations for the Rigel uh, and, and its potential future, maybe even some potential follow-ons. Uh, so I'll let you uh, take the show to see a description of the Rigel, some of its capabilities, and uh, we can see how well it's uh, stacked up to everything out there that's not even close. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So yeah, you know, it's a, oh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Ed DeReyes, the uh, chairman and CEO of Saberwing Aircraft Company. And so uh, we did, we started with a clean sheet and, and having been in the air cargo business before, I, which I was the, as a, as a part 135 uh, owner operator, I knew there were certain things, especially talking with my peers and people from FedEx and UPS that there were certain must-haves. We didn't just go out there and figure, hey, let's build a cargo drone and then and then go out and sell it. I think, luckily enough, most of our competition has done that, but uh, but we have not. We started with asking them questions. We took practical knowledge um, and other things that you know we knew that I knew I wanted to have. I knew others were looking at doing that as well. So we designed the Rigel, and we the first uh, one that we designed is the one that you see here behind me, um, and this is actually a little bit smaller than the than the one that will go into production here very shortly. Uh, this has got a thirty foot wingspan, but it will carry uh, twenty two hundred pounds of cargo and um, uh, vertically, so it'll take off and land with twenty two hundred pounds. Um, and it'll take off uh, conventionally, very short takeoff. As a matter of fact, super stall, uh, it'll take off with 3,500 pounds of cargo. And uh, it's got a box, a cargo box of about 350 cubic feet. So it's fairly sizable uh, in comparison. The biggest one, uh, it, if you're not flying a, a you know, a, a swear engine a metro or a uh, it's, you know, right up there with the smaller ones, right up there with things like the caravan. Um, <clears throat> the larger one um, is the, uh, it's got a 70 foot wingspan. That's got a much bigger uh, cube. It's almost a 700 foot cube. It'll carry, it'll take off and land vertically with 5,400 pounds and take off and land conventionally with uh, close to 10,000 pounds. So it's it's really meant to carry a lot of cargo, and and that one, the larger one, will also carry uh, uh, LD containers, the ULD containers. So it'll carry LD ones, LD twos, a mix of those. Um, so it's really designed to be able to do that. So it's really a first, middle, and in many cases even a last mile uh, carrier. Um, and it's really it's sized there just right. So the it it operates extremely efficiently. Um, it is turbine powered. We actually were the first company to to fly an aircraft uh, a turbo electric drivetrain, um, despite what others have said. But we our company was last year. So uh, got in the air, did really well. Carried a 829 pound payload, 374 kilos, but 829 pound payload on our first flight. So we we just kicked the pants off of everybody else who's out there right now. We carried the largest civilian load on a drone ever for any any uh, uh, uncrewed aircraft. So we're we're pretty darn proud of it and no not to reveal too many secrets but we are we have another couple of drones up our sleeve that you may be seeing sometime within the next year or so. Mm -hmm. So the intention here is to become the largest drone manufacturer um uh, in the world and we're very quickly headed in that direction. Now, are you talking cargo only or expanding to other areas? Expanding to other areas. Okay. So it's not, not just cargo. We are going to do cargo, but we will have 
you know, uh, ISR aircraft. Uh, the only thing we're steering clear of is any kind of lethal cargo um, or lethal uses for the aircraft. Um, we're, that's there really isn't any interest either within the company or outside of the company uh, for us to supply any kind of a lethal um, sort of application for this aircraft. Okay. Now um, you mentioned the uh, the stall capability. Um, would you be able to maximize it with a stall takeoff and still do a vertical landing? Is there enough uh, fuel usage in the flight to, to make that safe? Um, it's actually really easy. If you can get in and out. Uh, so this aircraft, for example, it can get at full at max load 3,500 pounds. It can take off in less than 100 feet. So it's a very, very short uh, run, um, and which means it'll even land in a easily in half a football field. Mm -hmm. uh, the the larger one, the same thing. It's it's less than two hundred feet is the ground run, because what happens is that the if you look at the nacelles here, they actually rotate for for crews, but it making it much much more efficient than anything with rotors actually. But even then, when they rotate, we can rotate them at forty five degrees. And the aircraft has a downward component of thrust and an afward component of thrust. And that being the case, when you're flying in the aircraft or when you're getting ready to take off, it provides the majority of that thrust down and, and back. And so the aircraft, uh, plus the wing is extremely efficient. It can, uh, the wing is designed really to, to uh, operate. Um, it, it's kind of an all-in-one wing, so we can operate at high speed and low speed, but it reduces our stall speed to the point to where the aircraft is uh, is is airborne uh, or actually flying before it ever transitions out of uh, uh, out of uh, vertical lift or even on the short takeoff uh, super short takeoff we hit the stall speed within two to three seconds of, of the start of the ground roll okay great now what i was getting at is you know i'm, I'm uh, picturing we're in a large cargo area where, okay, we got runway to to take advantage of the stall capabilities and be more efficient, but we're going to an emergency uh, recovery or uh, humanitarian delivery that doesn't have that same runway. Um, would you, you have had to limit your the, the cargo load for a strictly vertical landing if if there's not enough fuel burn off to be within a safe limit it yeah uh, that's correct yeah so we we actually have scoped it out one of our first customers is the world health world food program um and they're leasing uh aircraft from our first customer and so this is one of the questions they brought up is okay so you take off short super short takeoff and you're carrying a maximum load but something happens how how do we still you know, can you land at that location? And, uh, and where they're operating, I said, you know, you can actually easily take off and land from a, a football pitch. Uh, it, in their case, soccer, uh, American <laughs> soccer. So it's a soccer pitch, yeah. but with more than enough room to to take off and land. So that's, um, uh, th there isn't any problem with that. Secondarily, though, there is quite a bit of uh, fuel burn. So we can come, uh, well, I should say there is, quite a bit of margin there, not fuel burn, but quite a bit of margin that allows them to come in, drop off their load vertically. Um, and then from that point, once the load is dropped, they can take off uh, vertically again and continue on to where they're needed, they need to be empty. Yeah, exactly. Right. So when, when did you start with this program? I'm, you know, it's a, I'm sure it's not an overnight uh, sensation, but uh, a lot of trial and error. <laughs> um, to the point that it, it actually started way back in 2012. I retired from Northrop Grumman at the time I was working on the Global Hawk program. You see a lot of Global Hawk in this from especially the concept of operations. So, uh, and everybody in the company has drone experience. So we have people that have years, the director of our uh, uh, development test and evaluation, um, he was also a Northrop Grumman uh, alum and he was the, director of test ranges for Northrop Grumman. So he, his experience as well, and specifically on things like, uh, uh, they call it BAMS, it's the um, uh, Broad Area Maritime Surveillance, mm -hmm. which is, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's the Trident, but um, that's the new one. That's the one for the name. But, but even then, 
So a lot of con ops on how uh, drones act in the airspace, you know, how we even coordinate with air traffic control, which is part of our aircraft. We're designed to go, again, flying at 400 feet with a big drone makes no sense at all. Companies aren't going to want to do that. It makes no sense, especially since the waivers required to fly at that altitude. Understandable, some of the other platforms that are out there do require that because they can't fly higher or much faster or anything else. So they're very short, very limited in range, very limited in cargo, not only cube, but cargo, uh, you know, capacity, weight capacity. Um, so they're going to have to somehow figure out a way of operating, you know, 14, two, two, 3,000 pound drone, but under 107 rules, which is currently not allowed. We're not looking for that. We knew going into this that we were going to have to meet at least part 23 requirements. So the aircraft will be cleared to go into any airport in the United States, class B, class C airspace, you know, the heaviest airspaces, we have that capability, which again is something that you would need uh, if you're if you've got a company like a you know, a Mariflight. If I told Ameriflight, well, you can only fly to one or two places. It's kind of limited. And even then, if you want to change that, you're going to have to get a waiver. They'd laugh me out the door. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, we had to make sure that this aircraft not only looked and felt and operated like a like a real aircraft, but also could go anywhere that a cert type certificated aircraft could go. So those were the basis of the design. So uh, that begs the question, is this autonomous or remotely poly piloted or potentially both? Right now, it's autonomous. So if in the military version, it's exactly the same as the civilian air, uh, version. Uh, the only difference is that the FAA does require uh, civilian versions to have a pilot that is aware of where the aircraft is going at all times mm -hmm. uh, at, and where it is, and also be able to take changes to uh, as directed by air traffic control. So that's a minimum. Global Hawk does that. Sabre Wing does that, you know, or the Rigel does it. So that carried over uh, into into here. So that is a requirement. However, you can, at the beginning of the flight, you put in the flight plan into the flight control computer in the ground station. And once it's in there, it can take off autonomously. The operator pushes a button. He can walk away and, you know, go, go get a cup of coffee. By Part 91, 131 rules, uh, the aircraft, if you file an instrument flight plan, you, sh in theory, you file an instrument flight plan, it's approved, you put it in the computer, you're all cleared, they give you permission to take off, and you take off and you hit 30 feet, you can go on to your destination airport without ever having to communicate with anybody again. If you hit 30 feet and your radios go for whatever reason, get struck by lightning or, you know, you name it, but that aircraft has to, be, it, it is allowed by law to continue on to its destination. Our aircraft can do the same thing. It's, there's no difference it could still completely operate under part 91 rules for instrument flight regulations. So I'm, I'm guessing it's the same rules as far as you can go as far as you're cleared. That's correct. Yeah. Usually, well, you, you're a commercial pilot yeah. instrument. And so when you, we pull our, our flight plan mm -hmm. and we're approved for the flight plan, they say, you know, clear, clear, yeah. Yeah, clear, clear to the podunk airport, asphalt or via so-and-so departure yeah. you know climb and maintain so they go through the whole thing yeah. uh, and but they're clearing you ahead of time so th yeah. that's going way back to the days when yeah. radios weren't that reliable and if you lost a radio hey you knew you're going to hit your waypoints set up your approach still be able to land legally at the airport mm -hmm. when you get there and so we do the same thing the aircraft is can do exactly the same thing the only difference is that we we must have a pilot watching where it's going. And even in the case of if we lose communication, we still have a secondary and even tertiary way of tracking the aircraft on the ground, independent from air traffic control. And we can actually pick up a phone and call the air traffic control sector and tell them, this is what our plane, where our plane says it is, and relay that to them. Usually they have it on radar, but you know, there's always that possibility that they're, they could say, Hey, we, we, you know, we don't have you on radar and we can then go back and say, hey, this is where we are. So the remote pilot may not be piloting, but he may be uh, doing the, the flight following like a dispatcher. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Now, now you mentioned Ameriflight is uh, getting some of these. Are there any other uh, cargo 
companies uh, that have uh, knocked on the door? Oh, absolutely. We have, first of all, we have uh, our main customer, our launch customer was a company called ADMC um, uh, and they're located in Riyadh and they're doing a lot of work for uh, uh, Neom, the new Giga Cities. They've also got the contract to lease aircraft to the World Food World Health Program um, and a lot of stuff going there. They, they're actually our bulk buyer, but we have uh, companies up in Scotland. We have companies in, in Norway that we're working with. We've got co a company in uh, England, another one in Germany, mm -hmm. um, and very shortly one down in Australia. So we're, we're, we're really... Right now, we have about we have two point three billion dollars in firm orders, wow. not not uh, letters of intent or we think we're going to buy one or you know those kinds. Mm -hmm. Letters of intent are great. I mean, they show that there's interest in the aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, there, we built the, the company on five principles. But that being said, uh, one of those principles was the fact that you have to show that your your company has interest in your product, and a letter of intent certainly does show interest. But the thing that is the proof of the pudding is do you have a, a, a contract that says, Hey, if you produce this, I will buy this. I'm not going to back out. And, you know, here's a deposit of X amount to show that we're behind this aircraft. And so right now, as I said, we have $2.3 billion in firm orders for us. Our priority anymore is production, 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 production. So that's our, that's our number one. So I'm, 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 I probably shouldn't ask this question, but I'm wondering, okay, 2.3 billion, how many aircraft is that? Just to figure out, okay, what kind of prices we're looking at. So it's a mix of, uh, and, and we actually are looking more than likely by the end of the year, we'll have another 300 million uh, right off the bat, actually a little bit more, uh, but about 300 million more that we'll have by the end of the year in firm orders. But um, the, uh, the, the, it's a mix of the two aircraft. So I think mm -hmm. it brings us to 280, 281, if I remember correctly. I, I have to go back and look, but because the number is changing. So I think we're at 281 aircraft, if I remember correctly. Okay. That's that's a good uh, couple squadrons. <laughs> <laughs> It'll keep us busy for a while. Yeah, we we haven't sold any to the, to the uh, military yet. Um, and it's not, uh, it's, and really, this is something they absolutely need. They've been telling us this for the longest time. I think it's, for us, the philosophy has been, um, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. So far, they've been coming without us having to to build it, but now we do need to build it. So, like I said, production, production, production. <laughs> yeah, we, we, I guess we, you know, if they're going to have uh, loyal wingmen for fighters, you can have loyal wingmen for C-17s. Absolutely. And and that brings up a really good point too. This aircraft, because of the price point, is considered to be a tritable. So the a tritable basically means that we're uh that they can t send out 10 of these to a forward uh, battle area, a forward edge of the battle area of FIBA, and four of them, six of them can get shot down, and it still leaves four with plenty of cargo left. And that was actually uh General uh Anthony Tata who's not not only an author, a published author, but he's also a very, uh, he was a former um, number three person at the Pentagon. Um, but anyway, his he specifically said, this will change the battlefield. This will change the shape of the battlefield. To be able to get food and bullets and you know bandages and all those things to a forward operating location and not have to worry about lives being lost and being able to generate within 15 minutes, get that to a forward edge of the battle area. That's one thing we do really well. We can go fast, we can go high, and we can you know, do, do just unload tons and tons of cargo in a very short period of time. Okay, great. So I was one of the things I was also wondering about, Are the, is this going to be opening up new jobs uh, in some way or fashion? Maybe not necessarily full-blown pilots, but uh, is it going to help the employment side of things or are we just looking for okay uh minimum cost because we don't have as many people no it's going to open up uh, we're expecting to add about 1500 new positions starting in january this coming january mm -hmm. so that and ramping up from there so we're going to start hiring uh very heavily right around january time frame well i think what i was also thinking about was the actual cargo companies 
Are they oh. just going to be, uh, well, you too. Yeah. That's cause that's important. You can't build it and give it to any, sell it to anybody else if you don't have the people, but, uh, right. exactly. Well, in, in actuality, one of the other reasons that, uh, not just Ameriflight, but the, the other companies that we have like our aircraft is the fact that it only takes a, uh, a commercial pilot's license and an instrument endorsement to fly this aircraft. It's, okay, good. It's, it's a turbine powered aircraft in essence, because we turn a generator and everything else, which under 135 rules, if you've got a, a over a certain weight and you're flying a turbine, you, you better, you, a type the pilot, yeah, it has to have a, not just a type rating, but With an AT. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So when you go take your tests, you're the, that's the first thing the examiner wants to see is let's see your ATP. But this does not require that because right now there is ATPs are as scarce as hen's teeth and getting scarcer every day because they're being uh, uh, swallowed up by every airline out there that can get their hands on them. There's such a terrible, well, they brought this up at RACA, the, mm -hmm. the pilot shortage is really getting critical. Um, and even some companies are, you know, not only scaling back, but they're pulling out. Um, who was it just recently up, up in Alaska? I heard that, um, there was a uh, one of their fairly famous or fairly well known uh, 135 operators pulled out of Kodiak, which was very unusual. But they pulled out of Kodiak because of the fact that they had a lot of trouble finding pilots that could do this, and so that that makes life very difficult. So we designed an aircraft that was basically push button. Everything is done on a keyboard. There's no throttle stick or rudder pedals to fly the aircraft. Um, so everything's done on a keyboard that makes it easier for the pilot than somebody with a commercial and a, an ATP to step in and, and fly the aircraft. They'll, they can learn the systems within a couple of days, get checked out on the third day. So they're ready to go. And it's plug and play too. Yeah. We're not using batteries, which are exotic at this time, still are. We're not using, uh, other than to start the turbine, we have no other battery on board. Um, but we're not using batteries. We're not using special fuels. We're not using anything. It's really plug and play uh, w within an existing fleet right now. So they buy this. It takes three days, three to four days to train a, a pilot up from with a commercial ticket. They can sit him in the seat, go out and, and start moving cargo that, that very next day. I'm going to have to hang on your coattails so I can see about getting a job with them. <laughs> we're going to need them, not just Saberwing, but there are going to be a lot of companies out there that really are going to start. And mind you, the time is bookable. So you can start in, into your logbook. You can start putting this time down and it counts towards your ATP. So that's the other thing that they like is, OK, I'm going to. I'm going to put somebody's buttons in the seat of the of the uh, ground station, yeah. and in 1,500 hours, he's going to go take that ATP test, and I'll I'll fold them into the crude or cargo uh, crude operations, mm -hmm. and put another button in the seat that's got a, a an instrument a commercial instrument, and he'll be good to go to he or she will be good to go. For that matter, one of the things that we've been exploring, and we've gotten actually a pretty good response is veterans who are coming back who are medically disqualified say they don't have you know legs mm -hmm. uh, or limited reuse of their arms the things that would normally disqualify them from uh being able to fly, exercise the privileges of their uh airman certificate this would give them another chance to do what they you know the, some of these guys have hundreds and thousands or I should say thousands of hours in helicopters and operations and you know in general just lots and lots of flying time but are not medically medically qualified to go out and fly an aircraft this gives them the opportunity to do that we're, we're not losing the experience of years of flying not at all not at all and it's just it's as i as i approach my retirement age which i'm actually there but if i repro approach my retirement age and i start looking at this uh it, you know it's one of the things that i thought was we need to give those people who are, you know, 65 and over who've timed out of, well, not 135 ops, but they've timed out of, you know, airline ops yeah. and those things. But, uh, but still, I mean, 70, 80 years old is nothing when it comes to flying this aircraft. It's not an issue. Okay, great. Well, I think we're running, starting to run out of time. Um, do you have any last words? I, I, then I'm just going to invite you on down to Sun and Fun and uh, maybe bring the Sabre wing with you or at least some uh, videos we can show of it 
I think uh, I think we might actually. That was uh, we're we're working on that hard. If we can uh, finish up what the, the you know the stuff we we're doing on the production facility, we're going to try to get there with a few aircraft. So okay, great. Um, well, well, I'm I'm helping out with their innovation showcase, so I'm pulling a plug everywhere I can to get somebody in there. But I'd uh, love to. I'd love to go. I haven't been to Sun and Fun in forever, and I really want to go. Okay. Well, that's what I like to hear. Um, is there any closing words that you'd like to, to have before you need to go? Not that I can think of. I think we're um, – no, I just want to thank you again for the opportunity. Great seeing you at RACA, by the way. I hope yeah. to see you again next year. So uh, we'll definitely be at RACA next year. And maybe even HAI if if they open it up like we think – like I think they're going to do. I just yeah, did it. I just did an interview with uh, Nicole Badges, who's going to be the new chair. And there, yep. and we were talking a little bit how the whole NAA, HAA is being rebranded uh, wow. to, to include more, I think, more of the uh, uh, AAM type of right. vehicles. So uh, it right. may, may just be because they're planning on making a big announcement on that first Monday of the show. Excellent. So, Excellent. Well, we see that. Uh, okay, great. Well, Ed, thank you very much for spending some time with me. Uh, it's despite the technical issues, I'll try to get rid of those. <laughs> but uh, if there's anything that comes up that you want to, you know, tell the people again, you know, later on, just give me a holler and we'll do another one of these and uh, uh, we'll make you a, a, a superstar. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate that. Thank you. Have a good day. Bet. You too. Thanks. Thank you, Ed, for spending time with us here at the Florida Aviation Network. We look forward to learning and seeing great things from Saberwing in the future and at Sun and Fun 2024. Saberwing is redefining the future of air cargo. For more information on the company, or, to find out more about our incredible aircraft, please visit us at www.saberwingaircraft.com.